advantage of the day. Okay. When you get an opportunity in this game, you make a play. Go yeah. Playmakers on three. One, two, three. Playmakers. Touchdown, Kansas City. The Chiefs are right in the thick of it, baby. You wanted it. You've got it. It's Defending the Kingdom, and we are back. Hi, everybody. I'm Mitch Holter's voice of the Chiefs, along with Matt Stat himself, uh, the Chiefs reporter, Matt McMullen. And it has been a flurry of activity, especially over the past three weeks. But here we are, Matt. We're going to jump back into it and get after it. Yeah, yeah. It's been a crazy couple months. It was almost two months ago exactly we had our last show previewing the AFC Championship game. A lot has happened since then. Of course, February is kind of a, a slow month for us after uh, losing the AFC title game. But uh, March was just as crazy as February was not crazy. And uh, the AFC West, the whole AFC, everyone's trying to load up and, uh, and catch the Chiefs, but uh, we don't think they will. But uh, lots of news uh, going on over the last several weeks, and we'll try our best to talk about uh, as much as we can. We've got a lot to recap here. And if you haven't seen it, I was on with Andrew Siciliano last week on the NFL Network, and I got asked the question, has the AFC West passed the Chiefs up? And as you know, if you've seen it, <laughs> the fur got up on the back of my neck. Uh, but you can go back and find that. Uh, you can find it various places. But this episode of Defending the Kingdom, we're going to go in three different directions. The first direction is what I call Spider-Man jammies. You'll get to, we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> Two is we're going to spend some time with Marquez Valdez-Scantling, the new wide receiver for the Kansas City Chiefs, formerly of the Green Bay Packers. And then thirdly, new windows. Sometimes springs meet, get window replacements. Well, a new window has flown open for the Kansas City Chiefs. So get ready for that. But before we dive into this, into the deep end of the pool, we have heard from the kingdom <laughs> which means we've heard from all around the world. So uh, the last episode we did, the AFC Championship game episode, as always, we said, hey, let us know where you're listening. Let us know uh, where you're watching us. And we got a whole bunch, I think more than we ever have. And just because we went on hiatus for two months doesn't mean we forgot about this. So I have five pages of uh, people listening all over the world that I'm going to read. Um, so get comfortable and bear with me here. And um, we'll start with our international listeners. So we have Javi in Argentina, Enrique from Mexico City, Jay from the Philippines, Cal in Saudi Arabia, Gail in Oxford, UK, Charles at Ramstein Air Force Base in Germany, pretty cool, uh, Adam in Turkey, he, we, uh, he also shouted out his Uncle Scott and Kelly as well. We have a fan in Singapore, a fan in Canada, a fan in India, Ollie from South London, England, uh, Hector in Mexico City, another fan from England, Amy, Julian, and Ruby from Santiago, Chile, and a fan from the UK who came over with the Arrowheads Abroad uh, a few years ago. Now, lots of people all over the country, as always. So we have Ravina in Charleston, South Carolina, a fan since 1964. Uh, Tyler in Windsor, Connecticut. And some of these have planted their flag, right? Oh, yeah. They have claimed the sovereignty of their area for the Chiefs Kingdom. Well, I'll get to that. There's okay. plenty of those. Don't There's worry. More. We There's are early on in this process. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we also have a, a fan in Fresno, California, Jimmy and Wendy from Sedalia, Missouri, uh, Waylon in Salt Lake City, then another fan from Utah, uh, Destiny in San Diego, Red in Arkansas, Brett in KCK, Eric in Warrensburg, Missouri, uh, Denise in St. Louis, David in Canton, Georgia, uh, a fan from Blue Springs, Raymond in Leadville, Colorado, Justin in upstate New York, and he was mentioning how that was right after the 13 seconds Bills game, and he was just flying his Chiefs flag proudly and wasn't very well liked, but uh, we support you uh, in upstate New York. Uh, Mark in Juan, Oklahoma, Jeremy in Carrollton, Texas, he's a repeat listener, uh, Jim in Cedro Woolley, Washington. Uh, Justin in Lebanon, Missouri. Nick in the Tri-Cities, Washington. I worked some Tri-Cities Dust Devils games back in the day when I worked in minor league baseball. Nothing bigger. Yeah. Uh, Nikki in Hannibal, Missouri. A fan in Rockford, Minnesota. Charles in Unionville, Missouri. Keith in St. Louis. Gilbert in California. Luis in Washington. A fan in Mountain View, Wyoming. Mike from Lincoln, Nebraska. Kevin from Aiken, South Carolina. Daniel in Seymour, Missouri, just east of Springfield. I'm sure you know that area. Yep. Uh, a fan in Joplin. David in Louisville, Kentucky. Chris in Bloomfield, New Mexico. A fan from California. Derek in Providence, Rhode Island. Mark from Idaho Springs, Colorado. Gary from Topeka. We've shouted out Gary before. Uh, Chris in Yorba Linda, California. Jaisky in Hampton, Virginia, Mary and Patricia in Weathersfield, Connecticut, and Rhonda in Virginia. Now, you mentioned the people planting their flag all over the kingdom. We right? challenge you to do it, yeah. to claim sovereignty for the kingdom. Exactly. We have provinces all over the earth. This, so. this started with a fan in Santa Barbara, California. They were going to say, <laughs> hey, this is Chiefs Kingdom West, 
right? Yeah. Well, I encouraged everybody, as you just mentioned, it's like, let us know where you're listening and claim it for the kingdom. Well, everyone did that, and we have several more here. So we have a fan uh, that has declared themselves the Duke of their county in Chief's kingdom. We don't know where this is, but they are the Duke of their county in Chief's kingdom. Frank declared the island of Kauai, so of course one of the Hawaiian islands, uh, as Arrowhead far, far west. Mark declared Thailand as Arrowhead far, far southeast. Uh, Susan declared Costa Rica as Chief's Kingdom further south. Uh, Joel declared La Paz, Bolivia as Chief's Kingdom South America. <laughs> Terry declared Queensland, Australia as Kingdom Down Under. And now we have some repeats because obviously there's only so many directions, right? So nothing wrong with repeats. You guys yeah. can figure this out for yourselves. We have Jordan declared Tokyo, Japan as Arrowhead far, far east. Uh, a fan also declared Yokohama, Japan, uh, as Arrowhead far, far east. And actually, Pat Mahomes, so Patrick Mahomes' dad, so the baseball player, pitched in Yokohama, Japan. I didn't know that. It's pretty cool. That is Arrowhead far, far east. Um, then we have four Arrowhead north. So we have Carlos in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, a fan in Omaha, Nebraska, Mark in Glasgow, Montana, and then Andy in Minnesota. That's all Arrowhead or Kingdom North. Um, we have three northeast. So Eric declared Brooklyn, New York. Pamela declared New Jersey. And then Billy in Providence, Rhode Island. They all have either Arrowhead or Kingdom northeast. Behind enemy lines in the Patriots area. Exactly. Good. Exactly. And we have lots of those, actually. We have another yeah. one I'll get to here in a moment. <laughs> um, we have two centrals. So Norma declared independence as Chiefs Kingdom Central. And Tony in Fulton, Missouri claimed that as Kingdom Central. Um, and then Richard declared Dallas as Chiefs Kingdom, Texas. Jimmy declared Waco, Texas as Kingdom I-35 Deep South. I like that. Love that one. Uh, Rob declared Rawlett, Texas as Chiefs Kingdom Deep South. Derek Johnson would like the Waco one, by the way. Yeah. Waco High Lion. So, yeah. Peter there we go. Um, we have a fan in Midland, Texas declared West Texas Kingdom. I just hear Friday Night Lights like, you from Midland, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have Ter we have Terry. Uh, she declared Aurora, Colorado, as Mountain Time Kingdom. Almost at the end here, we have three uh, Northwest. So we have a fan in Burnaby, Canada, declared Arrowhead Northwest. A fan in Portland, Oregon, they decided to secede from Seahawk Nation in the Portland Kingdom Northwest. And then Love Stephen it. declared Lewiston, Idaho, as Arrowhead Pacific Northwest. <laughs> We have Matthew. He declared Rock Island, Illinois as Arrowhead Prime. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, Eduardo declared Puerto Vallarta, Mexico as Chiefs Kingdom, Mexico. Rasta and their fiance, Rachel, declared Calabash, North Carolina as the Kingdom in Carolina. Kind of like that. It's unique. And lastly, Zulu declared Las Vegas as Kingdom Southwest. Well, that's definitely now <laughs> behind enemy territory, being yeah. in Vegas. Next challenge would be if someone would let us, got to send us a photo of this to authenticate it, either from the international dateline <laughs> or the equator, okay, because we're claiming all points of the earth. Yep. Uh, we had some Antarctica, though, didn't we, at one point? Have we had, we've had no, one. No, and, and Antarctica is the one place we have not Wide open territory. A penguin or something, you know? Yeah, we need Walrus. something if you're in Antarctica and claim it for the chief's kingdom. <laughs> uh, but next would be if you're on the international dateline, stop. Show us a picture saying you're there or the equator, anywhere upon the, the equator. You know, I did a similar thing once. My dad and I used to throw the baseball and play catch in different places around the world, and we did it in Ecuador over the equator once. It's pretty cool. That's why you're the Matt's dad, see? You just, <laughs> you've done things that none of us have ever done. Okay, playing catch on the equator. That's always good. Let's jump in now to this, uh, get into the meat of the matter here. Uh, let's start with what I call Spider-Man jammies. Free agency and what it's become in the National Football League, and not just the ringing the bell like the New York Stock Exchange to start the frenzy. Oh, now we have the 24 to 48 hours legal tampering, uh, <laughs> which causes everybody to lose their mind, and then free agency starts. But what I call it Spider Man Jammies because to me, this is the equivalent of Black Friday shopping after Thanksgiving, yeah. right? People can't get it online, or they're told they can't get it online. So they're going to line up outside of the store at 3 a.m., and the store doesn't open until 9, but they're going to wait six hours and go through fasting and having sterno cans <laughs> just to wait to get into the store to get a Spider-Man jammy. Now, you can get them a week later at 20% less or get them on sale after January, but you got to have it on Black Friday. You catch my drift here. I do. Right? Or head in the electronics and headed for the latest gadget uh, to get it. But that, to me, is what NFL free agency is like in the first four or five days. And we saw particularly the AFC West 
go absolutely crazy. Yeah, we did. Also, legal tampering is kind of an oxymoron. Isn't it seems it? like that. Yeah. yeah. But, but we saw a lot, and we're just refreshing You Twitter. cannot speed, people. Drive safely. <laughs> Except the 24 hours in, in advance of that, and you can just drive however fast you want. <laughs> I don't get it, but it's turned into craziness. Yeah, well, we saw that across the league, and we're just refreshing yeah. Twitter like everyone else, trying to see where these guys are ending up. Uh, and we mentioned how the AFC West and the AFC as a whole uh, is maybe a bit tired of seeing the Chiefs host the AFC title game every single year. And you or can't winning really the blame division them. six straight years. Exactly. Okay. And they're doing whatever they can in free agency to find a way to catch up to the Chiefs. So we saw um, the Chargers trading for Khalil Mack, signing J.C. Jackson to a huge deal, uh, making a lot of moves along the defensive line. So the Broncos, of course, trade for Russell Wilson uh, and do some other things like get Randy Gregory. Uh, and then, you know, the Raiders, of course, signing Chandler Jones, um, signing Max Crosby to a big extension and trading for Devontae Adams. So uh, these teams in the AFC West and in the AFC as a whole, we saw what the Bills did going after Von Miller. Um, they're trying to load up and get all their horses to see what they can do when the season gets here. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I know a lot of people are saying that the AFC West could be the best division in NFL history. We'll see if it plays out that way. But uh, as you mentioned on uh, NFL Network just a few days ago, who's the six-time defending AFC West champion? Who has Patrick Mahomes and Coach Reed? Uh, we do. So it should be a lot of a lot of fun seeing how this all plays out. But they're coming for us for sure. They're doing what they can in free agency to try to come after the Chiefs. And it's not as if the Chiefs have just set on the side and go, oh, okay, just let us know when this is all over because the Chiefs have been active as well. Now, let's talk about the cost here. This is Spider-Man jammies, right, on the Friday of Black Friday, and you're paying 100 bucks for the Spider-Man jammies whose eyes light up. <laughs> That's what it feels like. Like, really? We're going to spend 100 bucks on that? Now, this is some wise spending. However, with the salary cap era, keep in mind, it's like your credit card. You're still going to have to pay your credit card bill. The Raiders, Devontae Adams' deal is $141 million over five years, basically $28 million a year. Took the market of wide receivers up. We'll get to that in a second. The, you mentioned the Max Crosby redo. Really good player. Tough to block, high energy, $53 million guaranteed. Yeah. Guaranteed. Not funny money. Guaranteed. For the Chargers, two deals, $40 million guaranteed for both Mike Williams and a good corner in J.C. Jackson, really good in New England, $14 million guaranteed. And you mentioned the Russ Wilson deal. That also included losing draft capital and sending players like Noah Fant off to uh, Seattle to play uh, for the Seahawks. It does not come without cost. And we have seen it. The Chiefs have gone through it. When you do this, it's, it's to me, it's an all-in for 2022 and 23 maybe, but, but there is cost here. Yeah. And when you do it, you're going to have to deal with it at some point. Well, and what we're seeing is these teams, notably the Bills, the Chargers, uh, and the Raiders to an extent, are trying to take advantage of not paying their quarterback a ton of money right, right now. And when you have Justin Herbert on their rookie deal, you haven't given them their big mega extension yet. You can afford to pay a lot of these players. But yeah. And, and we've it, gone through that, right? Sure, so, yeah, yeah. And we enjoyed it's just the, the benefits normal of it. laps around the track we talked about. Yeah. yeah. But how does a team handle the second portion of that once you pay your quarterback? And that's what we're seeing the Chiefs handle right now. And I think uh, handling it in a, a very forward-thinking way, I think. We'll get into that later, but it'll be interesting to see these contracts for teams like the Bills uh, when you give Von Miller all that money, or the Chargers when you give all that guaranteed money to players, how that affects them in a couple years. And that story will write itself, but a lot of competition for sure in the AFC. Part of the correction here for the Chiefs, too, in dealing with that, because they are in the so what we call the second lap of Patrick Mahomes' career, uh, and now his extension and his bigger contract, has been the way the Chiefs have started to put together their roster. Now, we're going to touch on this a little bit later in the new windows portion of this Defending the Kingdom podcast, but the Chiefs have been busy. So let's start here with Justin Reed, the safety from the Houston Texans, a guy who has been highly productive there, uh, was highly thought of coming out of Stanford, but a physical player, an athletic player, ball skills here, um, and for the most part has been very durable, had some injury issues last year, but durable and reliable. He seems to be like a safety that complements Juan Thornhill very well. And what Steve Spagnola likes to do in the fact that he asks his safeties, remember, we play three safety nickel a lot, or we'll play three safety dime, six DBs a lot. And Reed seems to fit that, uh, that scheme and the, the, um, 
the skill set that Spags wants. Yeah, super excited for this kid. First of all, he's young. He's only 25 years old, so you're investing in the fact that he's going to get better over the next several years. But really, it's three things for me when I look at Justin Reed. It's size. He's six foot one, 203 pounds. He's exceptionally athletic, and you hinted at that. And also, he's versatile. He's super versatile. He can play all over the place. So you can play him at free safety, but you can also put him in the box. You can put him at slot corner if you need to. He can even be your kicker. You see those videos of him <laughs> yeah. in the preseason last year for the yeah. Texans, like booting a kickoff. And this also shows his athleticism because on one of those kickoffs, which first of all, what? A safety is kicking the ball off like an NFL kicker could? Loved it. Uh, and actually doing a really good job of it. But he also got down the field in coverage and made a tackle on one of those kickoffs. So it shows just how athletic this kid is. And like I mentioned, you're investing in the fact that he's only going to get better over time. He made a ton of big plays for the Texans in his time there. Uh, plays that won games for the Texans, particularly in his first two years uh, as a player in this league. The Texans overall just haven't had a ton of success as a team. We all know that, but he's one of the bright spots on that group, so really excited for Justin Reed to be a member of this defense. He's physical, doesn't afraid, not afraid to tackle. Remember the hit he had on uh, Tyree Kill actually in the playoffs. That was a big time hit, but think about a three safety nickel here a quasi-safety corner hybrid in Sneed. If you have Sneed, Reed, and Thornhill, you've got three high-level athletes uh, in that coverage scheme. All right, let's go quickly with Deion Bush from the Bears coming over. Great special teams guy. Um, eight special teams tackles last year for Chicago. Let's jump into these offensive guys, though. Uh, Juju Smith-Schuster got everybody's attention. Now, everybody in the Chiefs' kingdom going, hey, give us the 2018 Juju Smith-Schuster because he was phenomenal in that season. Just get him healthy and ready to go, but we know the talent's there. Yeah, the talent is certainly there. First of all, this guy has size. We all know that. He's a bigger-bodied receiver, but he can also stretch the field vertically, particularly in that 2018 season where he was so good for the Steelers. Uh, he could stretch the field vertically with the best of them. Where he's really been utilized lately, though, is in the short, intermediate routes out of the slot. So 62% of his targets over the last two seasons were on those short routes between 1 and 10 yards from the line of scrimmage. I think if teams are going to defend the Chiefs a certain way, and we'll see what they do next year with Tyreek Hill no longer being in the fold for the Chiefs, but if you want to open up the middle of the field, Juju Smith-Schuster is going to live there over and over again, and he's the kind of receiver that can get himself open. You don't need to scheme open Juju Smith-Schuster. He's a capable veteran receiver in this league that can get himself open and read a defense and adjust accordingly. So I'm really excited to see what a healthy Juju Smith-Schuster can do in this offense. Uh, and as we'll talk about with other players this team is adding, it's several veteran capable receivers that know how to read a defense and know how to get themselves open and when you have lots of different players that can do that if you're a defense you can't key in on just one guy you can't key in on Travis Kelsey you can't just key in on Juju Smith-Schuster so uh, if he can stay healthy once again I expect a big year uh, from Juju as both an intermediate short game threat and a vertical threat down the field. Yeah, and he's been around winning football, was with a high-level quarterback in Ben Roethlisberger although at the end of his career the last couple of years but in 18 Big Ben was still slinging it now the other thing here, and to be honest, with Tyreek Hill, we know about his speed and the Wasp and all that. But last year, only Justin Jefferson was better in third down receptions for first down. So who's going to fill that void? Because that's the sneaky void. You've got the chain mover, basically. And these guys all can do that. But Juju Smith-Schuster's ability to get open in that second uh, part of the field is big, I think, for this team. All right, quickly go to Ronald Jones Jr. Now, there are some plays that are etched into my brain that I just can't see anything else but that. But when we got Ronald Jones Jr., it was the throw in the flat against the Chiefs in the 2020 regular <laughs> season game in Tampa. He was outstanding on that play. And that's his only receiving touchdown. But keep in mind now, we're talking a lot of productivity and a tough physical runner that is athletic. Kind of in the Damian uh, Williams uh, mood here, road here. But the fact that you've got a bigger, stronger, faster back to complement the guys that are already in that RB room. I think that's the biggest thing. He's a complement in this RB room, and he's not very old. He's only been in the league four years, right? Seems like he's been in longer. It, it does. Right. It seems like he's been in the league a long time, but this kid is still super young in his mid-20s, room to grow, just like a guy like Justin Reed. Uh, and when you think about what he does best, it's in between the tackles, downhill running. 
And the Chiefs, that's an area where they could really use a guy who can really do that uh, with effectiveness. Just a season removed, of course, from 978 rushing yards and eight total touchdowns while averaging 5.1 yards per carry. That was among the best numbers in the NFL for running backs in terms of that yards per carry average. I mean, he was their starter for the most part until Leonard Fournette really started taking all the carries uh, in Tampa. Um, Back-to-back seasons with 1,000 yards from scrimmage between the 19 and 20 seasons. So he's done this recently. And I mentioned between the tackles, uh, back in 2020, he rushed for 712 yards and averaged 5.8 yards per carry between the tackles. So if you need three or four yards, Ronald Jones traditionally has been a guy you can turn around, give him the football, and he can find a way to get that yardage. So I'm excited to see how he kind of fits in to what the Chiefs want to do. Once again, with no Tyreek Hill on this team anymore, I think the scheme, it's an opportunity for the scheme to evolve in a lot of ways. And Ronald Jones, being part of this team now, should be an interesting part of that. And part of that chain-moving thing I was talking about, third and short doesn't always necessarily mean throwing the ball. And so Ronald Jones Jr. can provide that. The other thing good for Ronald Jones Jr. and good for the Chiefs is the fact that you're not asking him to carry it 25 times or have 30 touches. There's He can get that, take some load off of him and use him when he's needed. Uh, that actually helps him in his career and helps play to his game. All right. Now, second part of the Defending the Kingdom podcast here is the next piece of the acquisitions. That's Marquez Valdez-Scantling. We've played this guy twice, played him in 19, played him last year uh, when the Packers came to Arrowhead and GEHA Field at Arrowhead Stadium on both occasions. But Marquez Valdez-Scantling, when you look at it, and during this podcast, uh, in this interview, you'll see I had my boards from when we played him. (laughs) I put them up to the screen. But on there you see some of the uh, biggest plays in the National Football League of 20 yards or more from this guy. He's got speed and size. He led the NFL in average depth of target two years in a row, last year and the year before that. He's 6'4", 206 pounds, but serious speed to go with that size. You really don't find guys like that very much who are that big but can also stretch the field. If you're trying to find ways to replicate kind of what Tyreek Hill did for you, I'm not saying he is Tyreek Hill, but he can do those same kind of things where he can run down the field, and if you're a safety or a corner, you have to acknowledge it and know that he can get himself open down the field but also I think the part of his game that can grow really in Kansas City and excited to see kind of how he does grow is with that size as a red zone threat as a short yardage chains mover so really excited to see what Marquez Valdez Scanley can do in Kansas City and it's been a while since the Chiefs have had a guy this fast and this tall as you alluded to now all of a sudden you open up what the Chargers do with Mike Williams Uh, back shoulder throws high point plays corner routes Uh, in the red zone, but you also get the big plays. 75-yard touchdown last year at Minnesota, 78 and a 72 in 2020. Against the Raiders in 19, a 74-yard touchdown, and uh, four catches and 115 uh, 115 yards against Tampa Bay uh, in the playoffs, or it could have been Green Bay (laughs) playing the Chiefs in Super Bowl 55, wouldn't have to play a team on uh, on their home field. All that being said, though, I love it when you and I both get the chance to talk to our guys and uh, had an opportunity to talk to Marquez Valdez-Scantling, and here is that conversation. Well, as we uh, pivot just a bit here on Defending the Kingdom, we give the official Chiefs Kingdom welcome to one of the more explosive receivers in the National Football League over the past four years, Marquez Valdez-Scantling. And MVS, welcome. This is your first official welcome, really, to the Chiefs Kingdom. Welcome, my friend. Thank you for having me. It's awesome to have you here. Uh, it, this is where you were in 2019 on my boards, getting ready to play the Packers. And here's where you were last year uh, on my boards, getting ready to play. And on these, it's like best yards per reception in the National Football League. You had five 40-yard catches before we played you in 19. Just uh, what would you tell the kingdom, hey, this is what I'm bringing to the table uh, for this team and for this offense? I bring a lot to the table and to this offense. You know, obviously that's just one of the things that I can do. Um, obviously, when with those stats, I was uh, top of the league, so that's what gets talked about the most. But I did a lot of other things too. So you're getting a, a true competitor, and I'm excited for the opportunity. In this offense, much like you had in Green Bay, you're asked to do a lot of things at where you play. Uh, what would you say about folks that say, "Wow, he's a great running nine routes"? I mean, this guy'll blow right by you, 20 plus miles per hour. What have you learned in this league about route running and being able to adjust? Yeah, obviously, um, you know, obviously I ran a 4-3 at the combine. and um, That that puts a lot of fear in a lot of guys' hearts. So you don't get too many guys uh, up in your face trying to press you and they know that you can run by them at any time. Uh, So obviously you got to learn how to 
beat guys in different ways. And uh, I had a great teacher in, in Devontae Adams, you know, throughout my four years. And, um, you know, I think it couldn't ask for a better guy to kind of show me how to be a pro. You played with Aaron the first four years. Now you get to play with Patrick. The play after the play, I thought us going back and preparing when we played you guys and now to have you on our team, there's the play call, you've got your route. And with those two guys, then there's the play after the play. What have you learned about adjusting, adjusting to the quarterback? And sometimes, hey, we got to go off script here. Yeah, I've seen playing with 12. Uh, he's the best at it. Um, you know, he's great at improvising and at the line of scrimmage, change something he doesn't like and, and get into a whole separate play, you know. And, uh, you know, we had to learn the offensive playbook. We had to learn Aaron's playbook. And they're two separate playbooks. Um, and so, obviously, with a guy like that who's that intelligent and seen it all for 17 years, 18 years, whatever the number is, uh, he's able to get guys into great positions to be successful. And so, obviously, I've seen a younger version of that in, in Pat, and I'm excited for that opportunity to, you know, go and play with the – same level of talented guy um, and, and see what he can bring to the table. And how much have you seen watching him from afar is there's coach's playbook and then there's Patrick's playbook. Yeah, obviously um, you know, every, every week I'm looking at the explosive plays around the league and you see the Chiefs pop up, you know, week out. So obviously they're doing something right over here um, and see him get out there and, you know, make all kind of throws and change stuff at the line and, and get guys into great positions. You know, he's uh, he's one of the best. What was going through your mind, body, and soul when there's a discussion with your people of thinking, where's my next stop here? And you were thinking, wow, this Chiefs thing could be real. What was going through your thoughts process in? Uh, I mean, well, the, the Chiefs weren't even a, a thought in my head um, early in the, the free agency process. Obviously, they had a a bunch of guys that they were, you know, set on. Um, they had reached out to my agent, you know, saying that they, they had some interest. Um, they didn't know, you know, how interested I would be in the, in the situation, obviously, uh, coming from Green Bay, you know, and having the opportunity to go back and be Aaron Rodgers' number one target. Um, they didn't know how interested I would be in, in that conversation. Um, but then they made the, the trade and said, hey, you know, we're, we're still circling back to see if you have any interest in, in coming out here. I said, you know, I'll, I'll listen to what you guys have to say. And get on the plane and then see what happens um, and coming home as a chief. So it all worked out. How much a part of the deal was you get to wear 11 again, which is what you wore at UCF. USF. Um, or USF. Was, my bad, my bad, my bad. Yeah, Bulls, uh, cool Bulls, it, baby. it was definitely a, a major factor into it. You know, 11 was going to be the number I picked wherever I went next. Uh, that wasn't up for debate. Um, they didn't have it open when I was uh, drafted to Green Bay, which is the only reason why I didn't wear it. It almost changed it uh, going into my third year. But I just didn't want to have to feel bad for all the fans that had, you know, got my jersey and you know, switched my number. So I said I wouldn't change my number unless I went anywhere else and somewhere else. And I'm back in back in 11. Well, there'll be people in the kingdom buying 11 jerseys now with the MVS 11. on there. So was eight plus three, 11. Is that what you did with the Packers? <laughs> yeah, almost. Yeah. A good way to put it. <laughs> well, you can wear it now. The double ones. That's that's great. Um, and speaking of that, uh, you got an awesome clothing line, man. You're just going on your website. That's pretty good. Have you been into that like all your life? Uh, I've always been into to fashion uh, pretty much my whole life. And then me and my two best friends, we decided to all partner up and, uh, and, and create some, some dope stuff, you know, six selection, S I K selection.com. And um, you know, we, we just, we're, we're doing it, you know, and we want to continue to grow this thing as much as we can. Uh, Cause we're all entrepreneurs, all, in, in different aspects of life, doing doing great things. Um, the SIK stands for Successful Innovative Kings. So that's kind of how we got the name. And um, we're just excited to, uh, throughout this process, to keep, it, to keep it growing. Kingdom, just check it out. Go to his website and you'll say, whoa, okay, this guy's a businessman. But you must have got it from your mom because she looks like a heck of an entrepreneur in yeah. St. Pete and Tampa. Yeah, she is, uh, she is, she is the brains behind everything. She's about everything. And if she can't figure it out, she's going to find somebody who can't figure it out. And I think that's the, the best attribute that my mom has. Um, she's taught me so much. She's got me into real estate. She's got me into so many different business ventures. Um, and she's opened up so many doors for me. She's actually the person who got me in touch with my agent. So she just, she knows everybody everywhere. She, she's, she's just a boss, a true boss. 
you're going to have uh, kingdom people wanting to buy stock in your company here. <laughs> Go public on the stock exchange. Yeah, man. Otis, thank you. Love for them to get behind it and uh, and go and support it in any way they can. And your stepdad must be important to you. I mean, you mentioned that in your formal presser. It's part of your name. Uh, but what has your stepdad meant to you? Uh, he's meant everything to me. Um, you know, I don't even call him stepdad. He's my dad. You know, that's why I have his last name. Um, he's my role model. Um, he's the person I you know, want to grow to to be like. You know, in every aspect. I think he's a, a hell of a man. And uh, anything that he would ever need, it wouldn't be a, a question. And the best part about the whole thing is throughout my entire life, he's never asked me for anything, you know, to come in and, and raise me the way he did and support me the way he did. And I'm forever grateful for him. How's excited your mom and dad about you being a chief? They were very excited. My mom was a little more excited than my dad was. <laughs> I'm excited, to be honest, only a few times. Um, and she was super excited. Um, so I'm just... Uh, I'm happy that it made them happy. Okay, we'll close it out this way. You played twice. I showed you the boards, but both of those times you played at Arrowhead Stadium. And I've been to Lambeau so many times, it's a special place. But now Arrowhead is your home. What does that mean to you? And knowing it's rare that an NFC guy would play in this AFC stadium twice uh, in a span of 19 and 21, twice in three years. What did you learn about? arrowhead and how much does it fire you up to think i'm gonna this is my new place uh well I'll, for starters I, I love the love the grass um definitely have one of the better grasses in the nfl believe it or not i played in a lot of football stadiums and i, I love the i love the grass and that's a, a huge factor into it um you know the, the saints i was a little afraid because of the hair uh not gonna lie but um I, I love the grass and then that stadium gets loud i was to be on the other the other side of it you know and uh that, that thing gets loud, and um, I'm super excited just to, to be a part of that. Uh, scoring a lot of touchdowns in there, and, you know, no more Lambo leaps, but uh, we'll definitely get some some figured out to celebrate. Oh, yeah, they'll wait for you in a kingdom, man. They'll, they'll do it some way. It's incredible to have you here. It's awesome to have you here, and the best news for everyone is you're back in 11, man. Turn it loose. Yes, sir. All right. Congrats, brother. And we'll uh, see you soon, man. Welcome to the kingdom again. Thank you. I appreciate it. So interesting. I, sometimes the number thing, <laughs> it's a big deal that he's going to wear 11. Yeah. Like that's one of the big reasons I came to Kansas City. It's like, what? That and the field. He uh -huh. loves the field. He loved playing on the Bermuda ryegrass mix at GEHA Field at Arrowhead Stadium. It's the stuff you would never think about. <laughs> I mean, we're not NFL athletes. We don't think about these things. But, yeah, the number is very important with some of these guys. It's very important to MVS. And the grass. I mean, it's just so interesting that he goes out there and he, he realizes, I like this grass. And he was talking about, because New Orleans was another uh, city he was considering going to, and he didn't want to play on the turf in New Orleans. And he was comparing that to what the grass is like here. And uh, pretty cool. I, I had never thought about it before, but I guess that's an advantage. Uh, trying to recruit free agents is our grass. Thanks to Travis Hogan and all our people that work on that field all year long. But it's an advantage. And if Marquez Valdez Scantling blows up here as we all <laughs> hope he does it just might be the playing surface at geha field at arrowhead stadium all right to close out here the third part of our podcast defending the kingdom podcast is new windows the new window that's open people want to think that was kind of the siciliano interview a little bit alluding well the chief's windows closed goodbye see ya you now you guys are done whoa 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 because I answered, I said, I'm going to answer a question with a question. Is the quarterback still here? Is the head coach still here? This head coach has won 19 playoff games. The other three AFC West coaches, I respect them all. Remember Nate Hackett when he was a ball boy. Tells you how old I am <laughs> uh, for the Chiefs. He was a ball boy for the Chiefs. But the combined total wins of all three of those coaches in the division, 20 wins total in their lives. Coach Reed has 19 in the playoffs. Um, we all know he's top five in the NFL in history. He's not going anywhere, and he's still got it, and he's, that engine is purring faster than it's ever uh, you know, hummed before. He's on full throttle. But now the Chiefs, because of Brett Veach and his moves, have opened up an opportunity. Let's start with the cap room. Uh, that This thing fluctuates, depend on the signings, but when the time that we uh, put this podcast together, the Chiefs were somewhere in the range of $23 million under the cap, 
under the cap. And remember, it wasn't that long ago. Everybody's freaking out, like, how are they going to get under the cap? Like, <laughs> you know, the world's going to blow up. Yeah, it's, it's funny. And I'm sure by the time this gets out there, we'll have already made several more moves, and this will be instantly outdated. But, you know, that's the interesting thing about the Tyree Kill trade. And the thing with you and I is you and I are Chiefs fans first and foremost. Like, we grew up Chiefs fans, and we get to work here every day. But we, we love this team as fans, just as we do as employees. And when we find out Tyree Kill's being traded, of course, at first, it's hard because we love Tyree Kill, both as a player and a person. I joke around that I think I went through all five stages of grief in one day. But of course, you end up at acceptance and you start thinking about it. And you think about how we have a generational talent in Patrick Mahomes at quarterback. We have a future Hall of Fame head coach in Andy Reid. We have uh, things in here, ingredients in this recipe that most teams do not have. So how do you surround him with talent for years to come? So you are competing for championships every single year. That's a difficult thing to do in the era of the salary cap. That's why most teams aren't able to do it. But I credit Brett Veach for thinking through this and seeing an opportunity to be what the Chiefs are, having this great culture that we have and a great quarterback and a great head coach and great pieces on this roster, a future Hall of Fame tight end uh, as one of those pieces, and finding a way to have, at one point, the most cap space in the NFL and the most draft picks in the NFL. And it's hard to see Tyreek Hill go, um, but I think this is a, a situation where it works out well for all parties. It works out for Tyreek in Miami, and it works out for the Chiefs here, where they can extend their window from being maybe two or three more years with this current band of players, and then you reset, or you get ahead of it. You still have a lot of great players here, and you have a chance to replenish through free agency and the draft and to open up this window for maybe 10 years. And seven years from now, we're looking back at this and saying, wow, that was a watershed moment where we got so-and-so and so-and-so in the draft and really set us up for success moving forward. So a weird week in Chiefs Kingdom, but I think it's a real <laughs> opportunity here to really, as you said, extend this window for a long time. And in some ways, a luxury, but it, in many other ways, a necessity. That's that second lap of Patrick's career. But, and I didn't say this on the interview with, with Andrew, was how many times do you see an NFL team that has won six straight division titles, been to the AFC Championship game four straight years, won a Super Bowl, finished runner-up in another one, that is going into the fifth year after that four- or six-year run, the next year, with cap room and picks. We'll close this way. You mentioned the draft and touched on it, and our defending the kingdoms as we get closer to the draft will focus more on the 2022 NFL draft. But the Chiefs now have, how many times do you see a team that's been that successful, if the Chiefs don't have control over the 2022 draft, they're going to have a lot to say with what happens. With six picks in the first 103, and two firsts, two seconds, two thirds, and two fourths, what it gives uh, to Brett Veach and, and the crew is collateral. Those picks move up or down, but now you have collateral and cap room. And what the Chiefs have shown when they've had collateral and cap room, they're very dangerous in building. That's the new window that you're putting in this spring for the Chiefs kingdom. There's no window closing. You're just starting a new window. Yeah, and eight picks in the top 135. I mean, so many high draft picks. Mm. The Chiefs have to hit on these picks, but you're right. They have currency to move around if they need to. And, you know, I mentioned earlier about how when you have a Justin Herbert still on their rookie deal, eventually you have to pay that player, right? If the Chiefs can hit on some of the players in this draft, some of these guys uh, that they're picking in the top 100, all of a sudden the Chiefs have young, controllable players around their star quarterback who's already paid. Meanwhile, these other teams in the AFC that right now, yes, are loading up, they're hitting a situation where they have to pay their quarterback. They have to play, pay all their stars. And that's where this thing could really take off for the Chiefs. So I think the Chiefs are going to be competitive, of course, this season and the season after that. But keep that in mind here, that this draft could be a real big moment for the Chiefs affecting these other AFC teams when they have to start paying their quarterback generational money. You're going to see it here in the next couple of years. This draft is a big deal. It's a big deal for the Chiefs. And uh, they bet on themselves. They bet on their quarterback and their head coach, rightfully so, I think think that they can hit in this draft and find some really good players that are going to hopefully bring the city more championships for years to come. Hall of Fame coach, Hall of Fame quarterback, cap room, and picks. That <laughs> should be uh, a warning to the rest of the division, the rest of the AFC, and the rest of the NFL that the Chiefs Kingdom isn't going anywhere anytime <laughs> soon. So on this podcast, we, got a, we heard it from around the world, plus Spider-Man jammies, MVS, and the new window. He's Matt McMullen. I'm Mitch Holtis, voice of the Chiefs, and we are back, folks. Join us again for our next episode of Defending the Kingdom.
Touchdown! Lock it down! And the celebration begins at Arrowhead.